Welcome to Clary and West's Summer Craft Talk series. This year, in the absence of a six-week workshop, we've asked our instructors to prepare a craft talk for our students and write-a-thon participants. Tonight, we're pleased to have Nalo Hopkinson with us. Nalo's work is sensual, riveting, and often a feast for all the senses. Her novels and short stories present futures where carnival traditions are held alongside self-driving cars and Aishu's automa automate houses. Her dystopias are rich with community, found family, and bloodthirsty duppies. Nalo won the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest with Brown Girl in the Ring. She has also received the Campbell Award for Best New Writer, several Locus Awards, a World Fantasy Award, and the Sunburst Award for Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. When she's not writing or teaching for UC Riverside, she makes mermaid dolls, jewelry, and enjoys sewing and cooking. Welcome, Nalo. Hi there. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to this. Um, I guess the first thing I should say is that I am easily distracted uh, and very poorly organized. And that's my brain chemistry. It's what I have to work with. Uh, so every so often I might have to stop and, and uh, figure out where I am. Um, what I think I will talk about today, actually I want to add on to that, that uh, background a bit. I was born in Jamaica. I've lived in Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, Canada for 30 something years, and then for my sins, moved to the US about 10 years ago. Um, I have nonverbal learning disorder, adult attention to deficit disorder, and fibromyalgia. Um, somehow I manage to write every so often. So today, what I want to talk about is um, really its point of view though I hope to make it more interesting than that sounds. Um, it occurred to me a few years ago that a lot of the things that, that when you look at a draft manuscript, particularly from an emerging writer, a beginning writer, a lot of the things that are causing hitching places in the manuscript are actually, um, could be looked at as uh, point of view difficulties. So, If you're talking about, um, for instance, dialogue that is uh, stiff when the, the author doesn't want it to be, often that's because the author has, is not grounded in the characters and the way they speak. Um, if it's description and exposition, and this is a question I get a lot, if you're, I'm doing world building, how do I know what to put in, what to take out? Well, you do that based on what your um, characters are interacting with in the world in the moment so that you aren't suddenly having a character who knows nothing about bite strength talking about the bite strength of a human you know jaw um, which is something I actually ended up putting in a story of mine so given all that one of the ways to ground yourself in character I think comes through the senses and I'll talk some more about that um, let's look at an excerpt from Christina Rossetti's poem, Goblin Market. And I'm going to try and do share screen, Let's see if I can find it. So it was there two minutes ago. All right, let's try this one. I think that'll show it. So this is an excerpt from Goblin Market. Taste them and try. Currants and gooseberries, bright fire-like barberries, figs to fill your mouth, citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye. Come by, come by. So when I first read that, I was a child living in the Caribbean. Uh, I didn't know what half those fruits were, since they weren't native to my region. But just reading Rossetti's words left me craving tastes and textures I could only imagine. Matter of fact, when I finally encountered some of those fruits, I was a little bit disappointed because I'd imagined something so much better. Anyhow, writing is an act of temptation. There's always some other distraction that could rob you of your reader. So paragraph by paragraph, your words must keep leading them on, luring them to turn page after page. And I call this, for the, the purpose of this talk, uh, writing nourishing prose. 
Um, and so let's talk about ghosts and feeding the hungry ghosts. Every culture has stories about ghosts, deceased people whose spirits have not yet departed for wherever it is we hope that souls go after death. In many cultures, the spirits stay here because they have unfinished business and sometimes they're really pissed off about that. In the Iliad and the Odyssey by the 8th century writer Homer, if you want ghosts to speak to you, you have to feed them fresh blood. And once they've consumed it for a short time, they can interact with the living again. They can speak, hear, smell, touch, taste. Because the thing is that what ghosts miss more than anything else is physical sensation. They're starving for it, in fact. Sometimes they'll take over a living person's body in order to experience those lost pleasures again. So when you write, especially when you write fiction, your words create a world, a microcosm, a pocket universe, whatever you want to call it. Your readers are visitors to that world. For the duration of the story, they will live in it. They will live in the story you created. They will live it in their minds, but they experience it through their bodies. Researchers have discovered that whenever we read or hear a metaphorical language that invokes sensation, our nerve endings responsible for that sensation actually fire. We have a ghost of a physical sensation. The same thing does not happen when we read or hear uninflected descriptions of sensation. So the challenge for us as writers is that as visitors to our pocket universes, our readers are ghosts. They have no senses. They have no body with which to experience the world. They are hungry ghosts. They're waiting to be given the blood that will make them flesh. So when I talk about the difference between metaphorical language that invokes sensation and uninflected descriptions of sensation, descriptions of sensation, when, um, you read a sentence such as, she ate a sweet orange. It's a far less eff effective description than, let's go back to Christina Rossetti. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in, what melons, icy cold, what peaches with a velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed. Odorous indeed must be the mead whereon they grow and pure the wave they drink, lilies at the brink, and sugar sweet their sap. So look at all the metaphors for sensation she gives us in a hand in a, a handful of short lines. Melons, icy cold. Well, of course they're not as cold as ice, so they'd be frozen, but using the metaphorical language makes our nerve endings fire. Peaches with a velvet nap. You can practically feel the velvet against your cheek. Or if you're like me, against your teeth when you eat a peach and then you have to go peel that sucker. Um, grapes are pellucid. They're so clear, they're pellucid. And then she describes the meadow where the grapes grow as odorous, meaning odorous in a good way. Um, odorous indeed must be the mead whereon they grow and pure the wave they drink. She doesn't say they drink pure water. She says the wave. The lilies at the brink of whatever brook it is this water is coming from and sugar sweet their sap. So she's packed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, metaphors for sensation into what might be 10 lines of poetry. So when you write, make us live, you make your readers live, make us feel, not emotions, we'll get to that, but sensations, because that's what keeps the readers reading. And for our purposes, um, think of movement as being another sensation to add to the list. I think technically it's called proprioception. That's that thing human beings can do and squirrels and cats can do that much better where they can predict where something will land in space um, by a series of very um, complicated uh, physical calculations. So Your sensory language doesn't all have to be about describing things that have sensorium attached to them. It can be associative, it can be metaphorical, so long as it st strongly evokes sensation. So if I were writing about the pumpkin soup I made on the weekend, or a weekend, um, and I, I wanted my list, my description might include something like rainy Sunday afternoon, struggled snuggled into flannel pajamas so snuggled has that idea 
but I'm associating it with soup. See what I mean? And your, your uh, metaphors don't all have to be pleasant either. Um, I'm really good at, at, at writing disgusting things and making people feel it. Um, and I found when I was on Twitter that actually this was good practice for this. Um, one of the main critiques you get is that Twitter is boring, people tweet their meals, but I'm a fucking writer. I can tweet my food and make you drool, even if you don't like what I've cooked, even if you don't know what it is. So that ended up being uh, a fun way to practice this particular tactic. Um, I'm reading my notes, so let me check back with you guys because I can't quite see you while I'm reading my notes. Yeah, that's one of my favorite poems, Goblin Market. It is both simultaneously the most innocent poem about sisterhood and the most pornographic poem about sisterhood I've ever read. Um, all right, I don't see questions yet. So, feed the hungry ghosts. Don't give them the sizzle without the steak. So we talk a little bit about point of view. I'm fascinated by bad science fiction and fantasy television. Not biting down on the cyanide capsule bad, more like having Spam and Cheetos for breakfast bad. Also by bad comedy and drama TV series that are about young, beautiful, healthy, selfish, ruthless middle-class people hooking up, falling in love, getting married, and having babies, sometimes in that order. So there's a TV show, a uh, science fiction show called Eureka. Um, I think it went to five series. I, I love the main, the actor who played the main character. Um, not only is he Canadian, he's got one of the best um, He's very, very good at physical comedy, which I don't usually like, but he managed to tie it into character. There was a whole storyline in which a character named Holly gets literally stuck in a game. Her body's killed, she's stuck in the game. That's a very common trope in science fiction. Um, and they tried to bring her back. And first they found her where she was, but she was still a ghost every time you turned off the machine she was gone and then they found a way to tie her into I don't know the mainframe in this village called Eureka so that she could be wherever she wanted to be and then they started building her a 3d body so that she could be physically out in the world because up until then she was tied to the machine and then finally they built her a body that was 3d and so complicated it was in effect a flesh body um, I'm getting, I'm going somewhere with this. Another show that I like to watch is Scrubs. Um, comedy drama series about hospitals and, and uh, doctors that fit the description I just gave about young, beautiful, healthy, selfish, ruthless, middle-class people. So one of the characters, Dr. Cox, has a wife named Jordan, who, and Jordan gets a lot of, of uh, plastic surgery. And at one point he's teasing her. She's just had everything lifted. Um, they don't get along very well together. She, he says something nasty to her. She sort of groans and he says, I hear the hatred, but I don't feel the hatred. So then she knees him in the groin and he very much feels the hatred. Um, science fiction and fantasy are plot driven forms. So when I teach, and I talk about this idea of building a, a, a body that's a sensorium that you invite the reader into from line one. I find that I, I tend to have to tell a lot of my students who write science fiction and fantasy to get out of their protagonists' heads and into their bodies. I have to tell the lit fic students the same thing, slightly different. Get out of their protagonists' heads and make them act. We're in a plot-driven form here. I have to tell students writing in any genre that repeatedly telling us how sad, guilty, happy, lonely, grief-stricken a protagonist is. I mean, think about it. It feels like the sizzle without the steak. If you say she was sad, she was sad, he was sad, he was happy. We see the drama, but we don't feel the drama. You have to knee us somewhere sensitive. You have to give us some physical sensation that makes us have the emotions you're trying to evoke. To readers, think about your experience of reading. It's almost as though you hover 
above the story at the beginning, waiting for a body to inhabit so that you can experience the story. Until that happens, you don't quite feel as though you've entered the story because you haven't. Until Holly was real in Eureka, she couldn't really interact with the world and the people of the story. So let me try and find my handout that was showing up just fine until I tried to use it. Mm. Ah, there we go. And I am going to use an example uh, I recently read um, in an undergraduate student's work. And I have changed some of the details to, you know, protect her anonymity a bit because she's doing a lot of these slips of point of view that, that um, so many of us do when we're beginning to learn how to write prose. <sighs> that thing keeps disappearing on me. There we are. All right. So this is the beginning of the story. The night was dark and clear as two Americans hiked the Tankyban Forest in Bratagodlan County. They were looking for the water spirit of Lake Wede. Look at how she's trying to pull you into the story, but she's done so by first giving you a voiceover. It's almost as though the author turns to you and says, this is what's happening. And then she continues doing it by saying, these two are looking for the water spirit of the lake. So you're not in the story yet. You're kind of hanging out, waiting. You don't know who the point of view character is. Um, you don't know enough sensory detail to pull you in. And she goes on and one of her characters starts to speak. So why are we hiking through the woods at 11 o'clock at night? I could be sleeping right now. Now this student, one of the things she's doing quite well is her sentences are good. You know what's happening in them. Um, and uh, so that part I'm not worried about. But here we go. We already know why they're in the woods and finally, so, and suddenly a character is asking why, they're in, why are they in the woods? So you have a spoiler on top of um, this, this slippage of point of view where you still don't know who you are. As a reader, you don't know which character you're, you're being asked to inhabit. Student continues, Resentments and, and annoyance resonated in her companion's airs. 19 and a liberal arts major, Satyr wasn't used to forests in the daytime, let alone hours after dark. So you, you have to do information lumps. You have to give information to the readers so that they understand bits about the story. The trick is to get in and out really quickly. And she's done that in this bit I have highlighted in green. Resentment and annoyance resonated in her companion's airs. Problem is, I don't know if I'm the companion, if I'm Zatra, I don't know who's hearing what resonate. Is one of these people telepathic that they know exactly what the way their friend is speaking means? But this last sentence, 19 in the liberal arts major, Zatra wasn't used to forests in the daytime, let alone hours after dark. That one actually kind of works because it's giving you this little bit of information. She's 19, she's a liberal arts major. It's done it really quickly, and it's done it in a way that the characters at you might actually be thinking something like that in the moment. I mean, there are better ways she could have done it, but that one isn't bad. So let's go back to... A lot of this is when the author is being the talking head in the story and you, you, you want your readers to know what's going on. You have to tell them what's going on. It's a good impulse. But this talking head syndrome where every so often you turn to the, um, to the audience and tell them what's going on, 
uh, some of it comes from the misapprehension on the writer's part that the protagonist's thought processes must be made crystal clear to the reader at all times so that we understand the story. It means that characters can become puppets in service of a plot that doesn't fall out of desire, circumstance, and interaction with the environment. It's the misapprehension that the protagonist's reflections on life, the universe, and everything, and how forlorn she feels because she has no sense of pur purpose in life, are the driving engine of the story. There's lots of characterization and brooding interpersonal conflict. The story never moves. And none of these are bad things to have. Be aware of when you're using them because they are sidebars. It's the misapprehension that the way to make the reader feel the depth of the protagonist's emotions is to tell us that he has them. So when conflict and tension invariably exacerbate the protagonist's dilemma, because that's what you're doing, you're making the story worse and worse and worse and worse until maybe it gets better or it's horror and it just keeps getting worse. The only strategy left when you, the only way you can tell some, uh, somebody, tell the reader that there's emotion happening is to say he was sad, she was mad, is that you keep trying to find more emphatic ways to describe emotion. She cried, he cried. You use exclamation points, ellipses, incredulous mental asides, and the story feels a little bit hollow. So how do you get that depth of emotion across? Well, descriptions don't give us life as readers, sensations do. It's the difference between, hmm, let's say nomination and habitation. You're building a body for your reader to inhabit. That body has sensations and emotions, not the names of those sensations and emotions. So let's do a little bit of an exercise if you have stuff that you can write with and on your phones is fine. What happens to a human being's body when they feel the following emotions? What physical sensations do they experience? And or what actions do their bodies do, if any? Um, jot down a few of these. So what happens to a human being's body when they feel terror? Just think about it for a second. What about dismay? What about joy at the sight of a loved one? Actually, you can throw them into the chat. Joy at the sight of a loved one. Um, what about anticipation? If you have anything coming through in the chat, goosebumps, chills, nausea, racing heart, yes. <laughs> I'm just laughing at, at uh, Louis or Louis saying, I love when comedies are more truthful than dramas. Oh, yes. Um, so, terror, we have goosebumps, chills, nausea, racing heart. Some of that might be true for exhilaration. Terror, that shrinking feeling. Yes, but where? Feeling of increased weight, a sagging feeling, heart speeding up. Shrinking feeling in your chest. Your breath catches, tears form in your eyes, heartache, spontaneous motion in your arms and legs. Yes, holding breath, clenched hands, shivers down the back. Okay, so you get the idea of what I'm trying to talk about. And you might notice if you look at this list that a lot of the um, sensations are similar. Human body only has so many ways to have sensations. Um, and some of you are getting some really specific ones which are really cool. Neck grains forward, smile increases in size, pupils dilate, steps quickly. Excellent. So if you describe all of those and you do them in context, your reader feels the emotion. You don't have to then say, she was exhilarated because our bodies are doing it so we know. And here's the trick, given that there's very limited um, ways in which bodies react to sensation, you can make some up. And if you do them in context, we'll think we feel them. So 
So let's see. You can come up with some surprising sensation laden metaphors to denote some of those emotions. And I have a really bad set of sentences right here that I have never rewritten because I kind of love how bad they are. That guy coming up out of the subway, it was Kerry. Kim's heart swelled with the beating wings of a thousand dragonflies which wafted him to greet his boyfriend. Yes, my editor will never see that. Um, but as I'm saying, you can make up uh, sensations to pull us in with. One of my favorite um, cultural expressions of this, this, this uh, coming up with sensory detail that the reader then has to sort of use, um, has to sort of put themselves into is um, Jamaican swearing. And let me see once more if I can find the handout I keep losing. It's gone again, so what I will do is put it in the chat because this going back and forth is making me a little nuts. So in Jamaica, we have a way to um, insult people by saying you face favor, meaning you look like. And then whatever the person says afterwards um, is down to their own creativity. So here's one. I think it's from Louise Bennett. Go away, you fear of a hang by nail. So go away, you look like, and then Bennett doesn't even say what it is that's hanging on a nail. But you can imagine like some of the things behind me, the sort of coats kind of hanging like on a nail like that. You tell somebody they look like hanging on nail, they're going to feel it. <laughs> so they don't even quite, they're not even quite sure, you know, perhaps what you mean. This is one of my favorites and one day I'll be able to find where I first got this from so I can credit the author who came up with it. So there's go away if you have a hang on nail. And here is the second example of uh, Jamaican your face favor. Your face favor Jack as I peep through tear draws. So if I translate that into more standard English, your face looks like the face of a donkey peering through torn underwear hanging on the line to dry. Mic drop. I don't know what that looks like but I'm imagining it and I'm not imagining somebody pretty. So <laughs> you can come up with your own expressions for the sensory that get our own nerve endings firing. Now I'm heading into half an hour. I'm not going to go too much longer with this. Um, let's see what else I have left. Oh. And talking about making up words, and I'll probably stop there, is um, uh, seasoning. You're using this making up words as seasoning. So when I started tweeting I, um, years ago, I would tweet my meals. Um, that was partly because me and my partner were actually uh, jobless, uh, off homeless, couch surfing. And if we were lucky, we could manage one meal a day. So I celebrated what we could eat. I remember making dandelion, screwing his weeds in somebody's yard into lunch with a little bit of uh, stir frying and with some almonds. I would grate lemon and orange uh, zest and keep them in little twists of saran wrap in the freezer because they were such good seasoning. Uh, I remember growing the same leek over and over. You cut it, you grow it, you cut it, eat that bit and it grows back. So what I learned about cooking with little choice in ingredients or quality of, in of ingredients is not to overdo so when you're making up your modifiers, give them as much punch as you can, but you don't need, unless you're trying to do something specific, you don't need to fill the whole story with them. So writer Bruce Olds is describing somebody who's just received a bad cut, and he talks about blood rooster tailing from a wound. That's 
a great image. It's a word that he's made up or a compound word he's come up with. It says everything about what the blood looks like. He gets in, he gets out, it's done. Okay, so that's been about uh, half an hour. Thank you all for being so patient. Um, this tells me that this talk could actually go on for two hours. But I'm going to stop here so I can hear your questions.